Hello everybody and welcome back to another build guide video. Today we're doing our second build, which is going to feature the build that you see right here, this Warbow build that I have. And I'm excited to give it a whirl and tell you about it and tell you my thought process as I go into the mists and use it. Before we go into the mists, let me tell you about today's build. So the Warbow is one of my all time favorite weapons. Uh, when I started playing it back in beta two, uh, it was a completely different weapon but through all of its iterations it's kept one thing in common its ability to kite uh, if you don't know what kiting is it essentially is the ability to backpedal building distance between yourself and your enemy while still dealing damage to them and avoiding their damage to you so kiting is mainly done on melee combatants however you can also do so on range combatants certain range combatants have shorter range on their weapons and hence you could also kite them and so this is why uh, this weapon is so powerful you could certainly play it differently there have been updates to the weapon line that make this a lot more viable now the ray of light its cooldown has been reduced twice in recent patches but i still believe even though the frost shot has been reduced and it's you know has has an increased cooldown i still believe that it is the best option for just general open world pvp movement it shoots you back it slows your target it deals a little damage it's really really nice the problem is we have to play around this we have to be very careful of how we approach a situation especially aggressively if we do not have our frost shot up of course the magic arrow is an extremely long range ability that deals decent damage on a very low cooldown i always love this and for today's passive as always um, i don't find this slow as powerful as it used to be so i've always just used energetic just to kind of make sure i have some mana so that's what we're going to go out and by default we're going to start with the multi-shot. This is an ability that knocks your enemies back and deals really good damage on a very low cooldown, but perhaps in certain situations we may want to go poison arrow or we even may want to go deadly shot. What is somewhat unique about this build is I wanted to create a situation that if I played it defensively yet still had enough damage, I could take people out. This is a more patient gameplay that I'm trying to play here, and this is what I mean by that. So I'm using using these boots, the royal sandals, specifically so that I cannot be purged by any kind of purging ability like the helmets of the Fiend Cal, the Arcane Staff E, or even the Helmet of Valor, among other things that purge. I find in my personal gameplay that these boots, although they do definitely, you know, increase your damage, they do have the drawback of decreasing your defense. But for me, all that is worth it, so long as I don't get purge because if I play defensively with it I should be able to like make it out alive and perhaps kill my targets. Next of course almost every warbow build tends to use the assassin jacket or the ambush. It's really good for avoiding big damage but also good for waiting on your cooldowns of other important abilities that you might need. It lasts for eight seconds and so eight seconds off of let's say the frost shot cooldown is a lot of time. You could also reposition yourself so that you're in a better position to kite as well. Now I normally normally would use the increased all your damage and healing cast and the defenses this one however I wanted to go cooldown on this particular build because I'm worried about my mana with this particular food because I am using this food for energy cost reduction I am not getting as high of a cooldown as I would with a normal omelet and it's totally fine to use a normal omelet if you so choose but I'm looking ahead and thinking will I have mana problems with this build in a prolonged fight and the answer would be yes in my mind but I I am compensating for the lower cooldown on the food with a higher cooldown on my chess piece. So just my way of thinking, maybe it is still the best option to go balance mind or even someone might make a case for swiftness. But on, on this particular build, I want to make sure that I am getting energy costs reduced and getting the same benefit as Anomaly. Of course, the Thetford Cape is pretty much a standard in most of my builds. Uh, whenever I go into the mist, it deals consistent damage. And it's just really good for trading, especially from long range as a Warbow user. The oddball here is this helmet, the, the demon helmet. Previously, we would have used the mage cow 
Cal for the poison, but as we all know, the Mage Cal was changed to have a Breath of Fire ability now. So we no longer have that potent poison. You could still make a very good case, which I was debating on whether to use the Demon Helmet or a Cloth Helmet here. The Cloth Helmet still have an ability called Force Field, which knocks people away from you, hence making your life better for kiting. If I were not to use a Demon Helmet, I would absolutely use a Cloth Helmet. And in the future, it, it might make sense to use the uh, Helmet of Purity or the Cowl of Purity, whatever it's called, the one that has the laser beam, because that's about to get a buff in the next patch. So Cloth is still a very good choice here. I'm trying Demon for a very interesting reason. I, I'm thinking in my head that if I'm in trouble and I'm getting chased by somebody who's like about to do a ton of damage, I can save this more so for a kind of like defensive slash counter attack strategy. And so I don't want to use it right off the rip in my mind. In my mind, I'm thinking there's no need to use this right now. However, let's say the fight is continuing and maybe I'm doing a little bit poorly. I can perhaps use that to like not take damage and, you know, reposition, or I could even counter attack and suddenly my opponent cannot do anything. So this helmet enchants your auto attack and silences the target for eight seconds almost. That's not going to be literally eight seconds based on crowd control resistance and everything else that the game, you know, has uh, in the background that's calculating these things, but it'll still be long enough for me to feel good that I'm not taking a lot of damage or my opponent is not able to do anything. So this is the build. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Of course, another standard for a war bow is going to be the healing potions. Always nice to just have some way to heal myself. And then of course, as I said, the dust hole crab omelets for the energy cost reduction and the cooldown reduction. I chose to use an armored horse today for no reason other than I want to. In my previous video, I used a T8 ox. There was a comment as to why I used a T8 ox and the reason is I'm an idiot. There was no reason for me to use it and I ended up losing it. But anyway, I'm using a T5 armored horse for this particular solo mist. As a friendly reminder, if you're watching this video and wondering where we are, we are in the city of Breslin. It is a new city that was created with the November 2022 update of Beyond the Veil. You get your own new island on here as well for a total of two new islands. And the way you get in here is you go to the Mists of Avalon, earn 50,000 Breslin standing, and then search mist after mist until you see a portal on your minimap for the city of Breslin. The reason why we're here and doing the miss out of this particular area is because the portal here allows us to instantly go into any kind of mist we want. Solo non-lethal, solo lethal, duo lethal, and when we leave the mist, it puts us right back into this town of Breslin. So we use this because it is the best way and most efficient way to go in and out of a mist. So without further ado, let's go inside. The moment you enter the mist, if you did not end up eating your food, make sure you do that. A lot of people forget to eat their food and it's part of the big downfall of their EVP careers. So make sure you eat your food the moment you enter the mist. So as you know, when I'm in the mist, I don't only want to look for PVP, but PVE is definitely something that is interesting. With the next update of Nightfall, there will be rewards to clearing these mist mob camps. There'll be treasure chests, treasure coffers as they call them at the end of these. So you still want to be able to do PVE. Now there's two ways to do this. If you want to be extra careful and ready for a fight at all times you're gonna just stick to this and try to do the PvE as, as slow as you can if you feel confident in your abilities though to spot other players quickly mount up you can always switch to ray of light which makes it a lot better on the PvE side and it still allows you to be good in PvP too if you get stuck in it you just won't have as much mobility and you really would have to land your W's in order to make it worth it so for us we're kind of confident in our ability here to not get caught out and hence, we're just gonna patiently kill this individual. You'll see the damage is quite good uh, when you switch to the Ray of Light. It would have been much more difficult and mana intensive if we went the other way. Now, in the next update, it'll be a lot safer, in my opinion, to do it this way when you're farming, simply because now the name tags will be clickable. So when you see an off-screen name tag, you will be able to actually like click on it and inspect it rather than waiting to see the player on your screen clicking on them and then inspecting them that way. So I believe it'll become safer for people who understand the mechanic to farm with PvE skills even in a missed PvP environment simply because the name tags will be so easy to spot 
and they're easily clickable and hence you can't miss them or hopefully you can't miss them now if you're still watching netflix on the other screen and you're not even looking at your screen then yeah you'll still get killed like you always have but if you're paying attention and you see these clickable name tags i don't think it's going to be that bad to spot now after we're done with the pve let's always switch back to our pvp skills this is the one thing about war bows that people need to get used to you're constantly changing your skills depending on the situation if you're doing pve you're in pve skills if you're doing pvp or if you're traveling you need to be in your pvp skills and sometimes after pve we forget that we need to change our ability back luckily nothing else needs to be changed during pve from a armor perspective at least not in this scenario but yeah just keep in mind that constantly check that out the war bow is generally good against melee. However, the sword line, especially the carving sword, seems to be a very difficult matchup. You literally have to essentially make them give up their chase by never playing their game of back and forth, right? Like, you'll be kiting them, you'll deal some damage, then they'll move back. If you move forward or try to use a sprint or try to use your raw shot to catch up to them because you think you're winning, that's when you're dead. And here's why. They immediately turn around they have a huge damage combo and then once they're on you they can keep hitting you building stacks of their movement and then it's pretty much over so rule number one in general against all melee is keep your position of kiting definitely never ever use your frost shot to try to catch up to somebody especially when they still could potentially be dangerous if you use your frost shot offensively you've just lost your best way to build distance especially with this build clearly you may still have your boots and you may still have your invisibility but one of the biggest ways that bow players die is by using their frost shot offensively and then their opponent turning on them so keep that in mind that's a very important lesson if you want to be good at this particular this particular gameplay i would also say war bow is good against curse staff because you can kite them out. You have much better range. The same rule applies though. Do not use your frost shot offensively because again, that could be your downfall. Ensure you use your ambush eff effectively as well against a curse staff. Generally speaking, if you go invisible, you can do so for almost the full duration, if not the full duration of their vile curses. So you can literally stay in vis so that all the curse stacks drop before they can really do anything to you. So use that wisely and then curse staff shouldn't be a problem fire stabs are kind of a problem especially if they're using the third q they have range on us a little bit and uh, they just deal huge damage got to be careful for them frost is very scary too they're one of the best at kiting themselves and hence they're great at catching people so yeah there's a lot there Let's see if i can actually catch anything here <laughs> the heck's going on there wait who's this guy okay this guy's kind of scary too screwed. I might be screwed here though. Okay, he did that to me. Alright, we, we got him here. He can't do anything pretty much. Shit though. Alright, he might get away. Oh, so lucky. Okay, so that was interesting. That was an interesting fight here. I perhaps was playing that a little bit too defensively. I also realized that during that fight, I could have negated his healing much sooner if I ambushed during that bolt caster E. Let's go over that fight. So I knew he had self-healing. I knew he had a demon helmet to silence me. I knew that his E plus his chest equals unlimited heals. I needed to stay far enough away and have enough interrupts even to stop something from happening his goal however was to auto attack me with the silence so that i cannot interrupt be close enough to him where he can get his full combo off and self-heal he was able to get a portion of his self-healing off before i realized i could ambush if i ambushed earlier i could have been full aggressive and then he would have been dead I could have literally 
have just ambushed, not even moved, and I could have killed them. But that was my error. So understand, this toolkit here helped us a lot. We ended up silencing him toward the end, so he couldn't do too much. By all intents and purposes, we should have won that. I just did not remember to ambush early enough. So that's a lesson learned from a fight there. Hopefully you guys can glean some lessons from it as well. So normally, war bows in general, I think, make good gatherers as well. A lot of times, in order for a war bow to, let's say, dismount something, especially in the open world, they require to be on the ground with a poison on their queue, and that way they can kind of, you know, get to their opponents rather quickly. So yeah, that's another thing to consider. So being a gatherer, there would also help you in your PvP in some ways, simply because you'll be on the ground more, giving you opportunity to make an aggressive move, and hopefully succeeding. Hit him, dude. You really fucked this up, bro? Wow, you really fucked it up. Oh no! Oh no! My shit got cancelled, bro! The fucking thing got cancelled! That sucks. My shit got canceled, my frost shot. Oh no. All right, so let's go over what happened there. That was a bit of a cluster. I was trying to force some issue because I haven't been getting any action in there for a little while. So that's number one. My first mess up here is that I forced the issue. I should not have been there. That was not a good fight for me at all. It looked good in the beginning. I tried to rat, but then that guy ended up turning it around. That was really unfortunate. I think I got too greedy and I, and I did exactly what I told you guys not to do. Aggressively frost shot in. I think I did that a couple times. I definitely sprinted aggressively a few times yeah i did a few things that i should not have there so learn from that death chat or you know the viewers on youtube that is not what you want to do that's what happens when you lose those little moments there you have problems so chat we're making a slight adjustment to the build i actually think the demon helmet is fine i think against a one-on-one -on -one opponent the demon helmet is perfect uh, it could also be good in ratting if you wanted to like you know stop a rat from escaping or stop someone from escaping you can silence them instead i'm just changing to a cloth helmet yes i'm using the cowl of purity but you can use any cloth helmet here i am using it only for this i want to be able to knock them away from me so i have more kite ability this is kind of the original build that i usually ran uh, back in the day in the open world bz but it works also well in the free for all area of the mist so we showed you what the demon could do and then we died in a rad situation now we're going to try this and see if the force field can help us kite more that demon build can also be used i think fairly well or the demon helmet can be used fairly well i think in corrupted dungeons so consider that build more for corrupted you could do it here as well in the mist but uh, we're going to try the cloth we'll add some more passive damage and we'll get some more kite ability fuck if i just auto attacked one more time he was he was dismounted. Yeah, he's gonna get away from me, dude. I guess that's one of the downfalls. Even in this environment, Orbo sometimes struggles to dismount people. Wait, what? Okay, yeah, yeah, we gone. I fucked up. That was unfortunate. That was just a gank. Anyone could have done that. 
This is a variation of the Warbow build that I felt needed some tweaking based on the previous two iterations. As you can see, the Warbow basic abilities are still the same. We still have the passive for mana regeneration. We start off with multi-shot, frost shot, and the regular E, and then we change it up based on whatever we're facing. We're doing PvE, we simply go Ray of Light. We're doing PvP, we go back to frost shot, and we probably would pick either deadly shot or poisoned arrow. Multi-shot still works against certain people too so we'll uh, we'll get back to that previously my uh, assassin jacket was on the cooldowns however since i changed my boots to soldier boots for the healing and the added tankiness i've decided that cooldowns will no longer be as needed simply because we're no longer using the royal sandals which had a toggle and hence the cooldown was uh, on the boots was longer i wanted to reduce that as well as try to reduce the uh, lack of cooldown on this particular food but uh, now that I'm have heels on the boots, I think Balanced Mind is the better choice. And as far as my helmet, I went with Cowl of Purity, mainly because of the force field. However, next update, this could be a very, very nice helmet for just about any build. It's going to have a lot of damage, and it's going to be really quick. So we'll start out with that. We still got our healing pots, our healing boots, our mana and cooldown food, crab omelets, and we're ready to go. The other thing that's a little bit different here is I changed my mount to a stag, simply because I realized last time we went out that... Warbow players need to be doing a little bit of everything when you're on the mists, simply because there's not going to be constant action for you for a couple reasons. Number one, you don't want to take every fight. Number two, a lot of people don't want to fight you simply because you have good kiting ability. And number three, there's a lot of rats, including yourself. So we're going to be doing other things while we're roaming here, and I recommend that you do that as well if you can, because otherwise it might just feel like a, you know, horse riding simulator. One thing about being a Warbow player is even even though it's usually not good to be the first one on the ground during a point of interest in the mist, as a warbow player it kind of is good because you are a very tough combatant to deal with if you play it right. So we're going to be dismounted with our mount out waiting to see if we can get this chest. If we see multiple people like you know running around here what we might do is we may auto attack one of them. If we auto attack one of them it puts us into combat and so if the other one dismounts he will have have a 15 second dismount debuff timer so we're gonna see what happens here see if that happens i mean it's clearly there's somebody to the north i don't know who he is though who are you got a bear paw that could be a little bit tough but i could actually counter his ability on his uh, e if i play it right okay there's another guy if the other guy is weaker i actually want to attack him i don't know if he i don't think he will be i think we get this for free all right, so see, sometimes being the first Warble player on the ground does pay dividends. Clearly this chest wasn't that great. However, you saw the strategy there, right? The bear paw didn't want to get down, whoever the other guy didn't want to get down, and hence you get a free objective. So as I said, if we want to do some PvE, let's just switch to the appropriate skills and have a ball. Once we switch to the Ray of Light, everything gets really squishy and easy and everything you would want it to be. However, as we travel, always switch back to the Frost Shot. You never know if you get dismounted and you need to be able to be mobile. It's another tip you always want to be careful for. So, right, we got ourselves a uh, Brawler. Ooh, he missed. This is how we do it, boys. Fuck, he actually got me here. That fucking lizard! You piece of shit! That is really unfortunate. Don't hit me. You f <laughs> Oh, that fucking lizard. I had that, dude! We started doing well until we didn't. So it was good from the start. We initially dismounted away from him so he couldn't just sprint in and do his combo. That's very important when you want to fight someone. Never dismount within range of their like abilities. You always want to like dismount a little bit away towards like the very edge of the name tag so that you don't get like rushed, right? That's number one. When I engaged, that was good. I didn't I didn't make the mistake to just dismount on top of him and just get annihilated and 
immediately. Next, we were doing kiting fairly well. We actually were able to avoid a few of his abilities simply by using our knockback at the right time and then sprinting right after. I think we missed the first one or two of his abilities. And then we also had a good uh, ambush where we were able to reposition and land our E outside of it. Everything was going fine until I didn't pick up on one key point that I should have. I should not have been Eing into his W. So if you understand what W he was using, it was the counter, I think it's called. I'm not sure what it's called. Counter strike or maybe, let me look. He was using counter. So enter a counter stance, increasing your defense by 75% while channeling for up to 1.2 seconds. Reflects 100% of the damage you take as magical damage. Upon taking damage, you instantly leap to the enemy, dealing 415 damage, and then knocks up all enemies in the air slightly when that happens. So he was using this. And so with me eating into it, I was getting damaged significantly. Uh, if I should have rather auto attacked more or multi strike more, because eventually this is kind of what got me into trouble. Clearly, I think I still could have won that fight if that rat lizard didn't come in and spit on me. But outside of that, that was one way you could play against a brawler. I, I believe I could beat him if we were to do that again without interference. Uh, there you have it. But that was that was a funny sequence of events, regardless. Hmm. I don't know if I like that guy. I don't like him for a couple of reasons. So Battle Bracers are a tough matchup for us here for a couple of reasons. Number one, their mobility is better than ours. So right off the rip, when you're fighting someone with better mobility than you, you are already at a disadvantage because no matter what you do, chances are he or she will be able to escape. So when you're fighting someone with more mobility like a Battle Bracer, it's going to be a tough go. However, we do have a counter to his E and that is a well-timed force field. This also works against a bear paw, right? As the bear paw or the E of the battle bracer come in, if you time it right, you can cancel the uh, skills. If they come in and they get bopped back, you take no damage. On the one hand, we have an option. On the other hand, if that happens, he's probably running, resetting, and he's gonna try it again. So you just don't wanna fight them usually, but if you have to, you will. He had a fucking tank set. Oh. This guy realized he's fucked, I think. Maybe not. Gotta watch out for this fucking battle axe. Ah! Ah, oh, he hit me. Ah, fuck! Well. What happened here is interesting. We had a tanky curse staff, which can definitely be difficult to deal with. He had the guardian armor ability that can reveal invisible people. So if you're too close, my ambush would have been canceled. However, we were able to out kite that particular person. When he cast his desecrate, which is the W that the curse staff has to root an individual, we were always a little bit outside of its range or we frost shot it right before it so that we made distance. We were never too close to the curse staff, and clearly if the fight kept going without interference, we would have been able to beat that curse staff. Then the uh, this gentleman here was there, and basically I was attacking him, but then he ran away because he saw I was able to kite. 
that's essentially the lessons there. Always be kiting, whether it's ranged or a melee, and try to time your frost shot with their mobility skills so that there's no time when you're vulnerable because each time they do theirs, you counter it with your, with your frost shot. That's pretty much how you, how you kite out people. Oh, what? Oh, hold on. This is bad. Maybe. Yeah, this is bad. Ouch. I might be dead. Actually, almost positive I'm dead. There we go, you missed. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just ran. Yeah, I'm dead. Unfortunate. So that fight, number one, I wasn't ready for it. I was eating something and then by the time I saw he was dismounted, I, I was not able to run away from him. And then number two, the Badan bow is definitely a very strong build. And the way that that guy was playing it was very well. As you saw, a lot of times he wasn't even aiming for me with his Badan E. He was aiming for mobs that were next to me because he knew the cone of his E would be large enough to hit me as well. So that matchup, Warbow against Badan, the Badan should win unless they miss their ease consistently. Ari is on a lower cooldown so that's where we get our strength from but the Badanzi pretty much he would have had to miss a lot of those shots for us to win and uh, unfortunately he did not. So yeah you don't want to mess with another Badan bow. I was just such an asshole to that guy. Give me the kill. Oh, no! Johan! Johan! Come back to me, Johan! Oh, no! No! Oh, my... <laughs> Over here, Gilbert Von Godfrey, where are you? What are you doing? Oh, it's going down here, Jimmy Johnson. This little Jimmy Johnson's actually my. If he, this little Jimmy Johnson gets away from me, I'm gonna be rather upset. There we go. All right, that's a good clip. All right, very nice. That was a great rat attempt, and and one of the reasons why Warbo can be a good rat as well. We started off the fight just being obnoxious to the little dual sword guy, knocking him back into the melee, and then slowly but surely everybody was taken pretty low. We just kind of ratted the shit out of him. Yeah, we were reckless to start off that whole melee, but we did know who we were dealing with. The people we were dealing with was that blood letter from before and like flat T4, I think, or whatever he was, and then that bolt caster. With our build against the bolt caster, we actually had, uh, were pretty good, right? We have multi shot to interrupt his E, we can go in Viz and cancel his E, and we can also be close to him and hit him with a force field to cancel his E. There's multiple ways that we were, you know, very beneficial against that particular matchup so seeing the playing field being very low the risk was kind of low for me to try to go and like you know do what I did and force the action but it ended up paying off so you may not always want to do that uh, especially if you're wearing higher tier gear like it, it's much easier to do that in flat t4 and not feel bad about it if you die that was pretty risky but it was good we ended up uh, having a good uh, outcome there frosty how good is this frost oh my 1440 these guys look friends. Why are you guys are not fighting? They have to be friends, right? Ooh, nice tree. Oh, wait, what? Bro, I was not prepared. Bitch, fuck off. He 
You, you know, even uh, we, we got kind of lucky there with that hit. So frosts are really scary. You really need to be careful with how you escape them. Luckily, our ambush worked. He went one way and we just went the other. But um, generally speaking, I don't really want to fight frosts. And as you saw, there were rats everywhere. So that's that wasn't a good fight to take regardless. I try to avoid frost staffs at all costs. I will rat anybody, but I will avoid certain ones at all costs. Hi guys, Black Bolo here. Thanks so much for watching my latest video. If you like what you saw, please hit that like and subscribe button on your way out. I truly appreciate it. Thanks bros, and I'll see you next time.